All right, we got a lot to get through today, so we'll get going. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're talking about how to make telemedicine work for your practice beyond this pandemic, beyond COVID-19. We're trying to look into the future, and get, we'll just, um, my name is Ashley Faber, and I lead product marketing at Clara, and um, I have Lawrence Spethman here, who is your host extraordinaire today. He's one of our practice consultants here at Clara, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hey guys, I'm Lawrence Bethman, broadcasting to you live from my kitchen in Chinatown, Manhattan. I'm really excited for you to join me today. I've been with the company for four years now. Um, really, I started by implementing Clara in person in doctor's offices in New York, and since then I've spent most of my time on the phone with them or in person helping them understand how to use these solutions to create better patient experiences and also just save staff a ton of time. You know, some of you I know through phone calls maybe, um, <clears throat> and some of you don't know me yet, but um, my focus here really today is just to give you a little bit of an overview of what I've learned from conversations with um, clients and then also you know, the research that Ashley has compiled and just things that we've learned along the way to help you come up with a more cohesive strategy around telemedicine. Awesome. Thank you, Lawrence. So yeah, within about 40 minutes or so, we're going to do our best to get through everything. Um, our goal is to really answer a few questions. So um, one, and if you don't mind advancing to the agenda slide, Lawrence, that would be great. Thank you. So why you should consider offering telemedicine for the long term anyway? We know that some of you might be skeptical about this, uh, not naming names, I know, <laughs> but um, I know, you know, there's a lot of talk of, is this really something that's going to last after COVID-19? And we do want to address that. And then how you can use telemedicine so that you're not just offering it on the side and that's that, but actually being strategic to maximize your revenue and really make it work for you versus something that you feel like you just have to do right now. And then how you can make your patients aware that you offer telemedicine. This will cover both making your existing patients aware as well as attracting new patients to your practice through this offering. And then once all these uh, patients have bought into telemedicine, how can you offer it to them without complicating your existing workflows and really making your life difficult? So we'll talk about some strategies around that as well. Uh, and finally, we hope to have time for questions and live discussions. So please add any questions to the Q&A box or into the chat throughout the session. Uh, we'll either address them as we go, if it makes sense, or because we do have a lot of content, we might just save it for the end during the designated time. And I do just wanna let you guys know that we have an awesome mixed audience here of Clara customers as well as um, not Clara customers. So any specific functionality questions we might just take offline, but um, feel free to chat them in and we'll address them or we'll uh, kind of decide how to handle it. We're just trying to make the content really um, good for everybody who is joining us today. Um, and final housekeeping keeping item, we will send everyone who registered uh, the recording and slides and any resources that we talk about. So just know that you will get these things uh, probably tomorrow. So no need to worry um, if you did want this content, you don't need to do crazy screenshots or anything. Throughout this, we will send it out. Okay, so why you should consider telemedicine for the long term. We do wanna make this webinar interactive. So we're going to kick off each section with a poll for the audience. So our first question here, and let me just launch this poll is what do you think of telemedicine? And I just should have launched the poll, so you should see it there. A few options here, it's a temporary fix during the crisis. It's useful sometimes, but I don't see it helping me grow. And then it can help sustain my business long-term. Oh wow, we're getting a lot of good answers here. Okay. Okay, we actually have 100% uh, that we, they think it can help sustain my business long-term, which is awesome to see. That's great. <laughs> that's, not what we, that's not what we were expecting. <laughs> yeah, so not that's, really what uh, we were expecting, but that's awesome. I'm glad you guys are all here. We have a great audience then. Um, so yeah, I will let you take it away, Lawrence, into our next topic. 
but we agree uh, yes. with you. We agree with you. Yeah, so <laughs> we're all on the same page. Uh, so this is going to be a breeze. Um, and I guess this may be then a little bit misplaced, but I think there's a lot of skepticism right now in the market around telemedicine. Um, so just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Really, we've seen the number of outpatient visits decline rapidly. So if you look at this curve, this basically shows you the percentage change for, uh, in outpatient visits from the baseline. You can see a massive dip sort of in March, April, and then uh, sort of a slow recovery towards like less of a percentage change in these book visits. But really, this is something that a lot of providers have felt. You know, patients didn't come into the office, obviously, because of the, the shutdown. Um, and the stay-at-home orders and infection risks. So I think one on one hand, we're seeing a lot of conversation in the market about around people that say, oh, of course, telemedicine makes up for all of this, but really only around 14% of visits were able to be recovered through telemedicine. So this is going to be different for every specialty, but that seems kind of low, right? Like, And for us, that's a signal that practices right now and practice leaders aren't fully taking advantage of, of telemedicine. And what we want to talk to you a little bit about is what are some strategies, how you can get more mileage out of your, your telemedicine tools, especially because a lot of people have now just invested in something. Um, so how much of patient care can be done via telemedicine? I think it has been a really interesting conversation for us as we've embarked on this journey with clients. Um, we, I think in my conversations with a lot of clients, I'm having more and more conversations about how to integrate telemedicine, not necessarily only as a replacement for visits, but what are some clever ways that we can integrate this into the other workflows of the practice. And so this tweet that you see here, um, you know, the, there's a CNBC journalist called Christina Farr. She did a public poll on Twitter that asked how many, you know, how much of telemedicine can really replace regular or overall patient care. And the consensus was around 40%. Actually, one of our clients, hey, Dr. Zotek, uh, shout out to you, mm -hmm. said that 95% of his practice could be done via telemedicine. And he's a surgeon who specializes in hernia surgeries. So the, the opinions really vary here, but it seems like there was a consensus that particularly for primary care, 40% of patient needs could be handled via telemedicine. And I think there's really a gap because you know practices like Dr. Zotac's practice maybe have been doing it for a long time and a lot of other people are just sort of jumping on the bandwagon now and um, so I think there's a little bit of a learning curve here so there's a lot of opportunity for practices and talking about new opportunities let's look at some of the different ways that this might create opportunities for your practice. So the first one, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're pretty optimistic is that we really see telemedicine as something more than just replacing in-person visits. It's a modality of care that you can that can you can use to create new opportunities to build relationships with patients and create new opportunities to see patients. There's a lot of challenges ahead. I think if we look at the last two weeks alone, we can all agree that there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. But Uncertainty also is challenge, and challenge sometimes provides opportunity to rethink the old ways of doing business. And what's been really cool to see in my conversations with clients is that people are really, really open, like all of you, because you're here today, to look at different ways to do business. And having telemedicine as a core part of your strategy is going to help you get back to baseline, but also is going to set the foundation for getting more revenue than you did before in the long term. Granted, there is an X factor here of when we get back to some semblance of a normal economy, but we can't really go back to the way things were. And with a different modality come different opportunities. Patients, you know, one of the other reasons why we really believe in telemedicine as a long-term solution for your business is that patients want telemedicine more than ever. Already before the pandemic, patients were choosing their provider. So 80% of patients were choosing their provider based on convenience and access factors alone. To all of you Claristas out there, I'm already using Clara. I think, you know, this is something that you've recognized. Probably a reason why you, why you partnered with us for which we're really grateful. And I think taking this convenience argument, if we think about why, you know, why is it so much more convenient to, to, to have this offering? You know, you don't have driving time or transportation costs, right? You're not going to be spending time waiting in the physical waiting room 
you can also reduce your risk of contracting something like COVID. You don't have to miss half a day's work for a quick appointment, which is something that I definitely struggled with a lot, even though my employer is awesome and lets me go to the doctor whenever I need to. You don't need to find childcare if you're a parent. And then there's a lot of other things like there's socioeconomic benefits and there's different demographics that have different needs. So for example, if somebody has a disability, it might be really challenging for them to get to a doctor's visit and it becomes way less of a production for them if they can do a video visit. Now, I think uh, a recognition here is also, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that this isn't just going to be a 100% replacement, for, 100 replacement for, for total clinical care. But like I said, it's a modality that you can use to get access to other kind of patient categories, I'd say. This isn't just us saying this. These are, there are a lot of studies behind this. Um, you know, uh, there's a study that was done by Kaiser that even before COVID, they've had a really, really strong telemedicine program for a long time. They found that 93% of patients are satisfied with the convenience and quality of real-time video visits with their own primary care provider as part of their ongoing clinical care. I think the operative word here or the operative phrase is as part of their ongoing clinical care. So Kaiser's recognized that this is a modality and they've kind of integrated into, into their flow. So that's exactly what, what um, you should be thinking about. And then, you know, on the other hand, also 84% of patients who've had a video visit thought the experience improved their relationship with their provider. And there's a cool example. Um, I was talking to my colleague, Julian, who's, who's on the phone with a lot of practices right now. And one of the use cases that he's been telling me about, which I thought was really interesting, um, you know, now that we have to wear PPE when we're talking to our patients in our practices and we can't see them face to face, it can feel a little bit impersonal maybe. And he's working with some practices who are basically where the doctor before the patient, while the patient's waiting in the car, before they come in to uh, the practice, the doctor actually does a quick video visit with them without the mask on to just say hi, maybe ask for medical history to get to know them a little bit and then the patient comes up for their procedure just the procedure just to have that personal relationship and that binds patients because don't underestimate the power of a really high quality good face-to-face -face interaction with your patients and so i think that's sort of one of the interesting ways that you can use this to help bind patients to your practice looking at this whole crisis you know in a post-covid world we see a lot of data that suggests um, that patients will want to continue using telemedicine beyond the crisis. You know, 29% of people surveyed said that they've used tele telemedicine and then nearly 90% of those people were satisfied with the experience. So for those who still haven't used telemedicine, more than half would consider using it. And then in once again, more than half are likely to consider um, using it following the pandemic. And I think one interesting thing to keep in mind here is this is going to keep developing. So there's a little bit of our virality element that we can anticipate with the growth of, growth of this category as a treatment modality. Um, and so it's really, really great to hear that you guys are already open to this. I did want to pause here and just show you some of the feedback that we've gotten for the Clarissas out there. Y'all know that we collect um, net promoter scoring feedback from patients as well as staff. So when you're using Clara, we'll pull patients and ask them how their experience was. And these are some of the things that patients have shouted out to us based on the experiences that they've had on Clara. You know, Jonelle said, it was excellent. I submitted my symptoms and they called me back. They even talked me through how to pull up the video visit. After consulting me, they called in my prescriptions. It was convenient and kept everybody safe from COVID. Um, you know, Natalie specifically said she didn't have to spend gas money. Right? These are things that are on patients' minds and being able to offer them, especially if it's an initial consultation or maybe even for a follow-up, like that's a great value add that you can offer a patient. And maybe that makes it easier for patients to pay their copay as well. We see telemedicine, like I said, as a method of care delivery. So there's a lot of buzz going on about, um, you know, will this replace everything? We don't really believe that. Um, we think there's a time and place for telemedicine and not every patient will want to do it, but having it as an option is going to be really key. And we'll talk a little bit about how to strategically think about this. Um, we, th we really think that telemedicine can be a revenue generator, um, particularly because we see the barriers that have been relaxed. Um, and we have a couple, of, so basically I'm going to go through all of this and give you our take about what we think is going to happen with them. Of course, we can't predict, you know, we don't have a, of a we don't have a, um, 
I want to call it a silver ball, but that's not what it is. But you know what I mean, like a thing that tells me the future. Uh, and we don't have that, but we can just give you our take. So basically cost sharing, um, which you know, CMS has just allowed providers to choose to waive cost sharing for telemedicine visits for Medicare beneficiaries, and a lot of private insurers have changed their rules to offer zero copay. We don't think that this is going to stick after the state of emergency, just because copays are such an ingrained part of the model for practices that it wouldn't be sustainable to do away with them altogether. Um, all the more, I think we need to be thinking about then as providers and as practice leaders, how can we make that copay seem really, really easy for patients to pay and like, sort of worth it, if you will. And it's and in that sense, it really becomes about how do you sell this to your patients. In terms of location, we expect that the requirement from CMS um, at least for Medicare, that patients uh, sort of that patients can can be anywhere. We expect that to stay removed, so you can continue to offer telemedicine for all Medicare beneficiaries from the comfort of their homes, no matter where they are. There's just a couple specific things about Medicare beneficiaries that this really really makes sense for. So we think CMS is going to stick with that. As for licensure requirements, um, we think that this is probably going to stay relaxed just because this is something that telemedicine advocates have lobbied for for a long time and it's only ramped up with COVID. The eligible providers situation, we think that the list of eligible providers that are allowed to bill for telemedicine services is just continue, gonna, gonna continue to grow, but it's kind of a wait and see thing at this point and then allow technology. Right now, phone calls and non-HIPAA compliant video, video are okay. That's not gonna stay. So for any prospects in here, whether it's Clara or something else, definitely, definitely, definitely get working on a solution that helps you do all of this in a secure and HIPAA compliant way. Um, it was a law of the land and it's in the, best patient, in the patient's best interest. So you're better off getting a HIPAA compliant solution in place from a reputable vendor right now. Talking a little bit about reimbursement and payment. So we know the biggest barrier arguably was financial. Telemedicine didn't really seem worth it. And there's an ongoing concern about whether people are gonna get paid, how much they're gonna get paid. Generally speaking, I think, you know, CMS has reimbursed stuff at the same rate. Commercial payers are likely to follow CMS's lead. I think the concern that payment levels could dissipate is valid. At the same time, if we look at um, what states are doing and also what Seema Verma, the CMS administrator said, it's gonna be difficult to, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. So it's gonna be really, really hard for the regulatory environment to shift back and sort of pull this revenue back out of people's pockets once they've been used to it. Um, we don't, it's called a crystal ball. We don't have a crystal ball for it, but um, we are certainly, very interested in seeing how states and then the, the federal government legislate on this front to help protect practice revenue. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that sounds super promising. And I think, you know, it seems like everybody here has already bought in to the idea of telemedicine sticking around for the long term, but still awesome to go through all the reasons and hear, hear about that. So the next thing we wanna talk about is, you know, now that we know it's gonna be here for the long term, how are we going to use telemedicine to maximize revenue and really be strategic about it? So we do have another poll for you guys. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide, Lawrence, and I'm going to launch this poll. So if you offer telemedicine, do you feel like you are growing revenue through telemedicine? Yes, it's helping, not sure yet, or no, right now it's just barely covering costs. Okay, we're getting some mixed, mixed feedback here. Okay, so most of you guys, feel like you're not sure yet, which makes sense <laughs> because this is new to most of us, right? So um, so yeah, some of you said that you feel like it's barely covering costs, some are not sure, some think it's helping, but majority is not sure. So um, Lawrence, why don't you take it away and let us know some strategies on, on how we can all maximize our revenue with telemedicine. Cool, tip number one, create a strategy. This is something mm -hmm. that's pretty foundational, but just 
you know, throwing something at the wall and seeing if it sticks is unlikely to help you be successful, especially for something as critical as your practice revenue. So really try and establish clear criteria for appointments that work for telemedicine. Some of this is going to be obvious. So initial consults and follow-ups are really, really good, whereas physical exams are not so good. Anything where you need to take, you know, um, sort of health data from patients, um, you know, physical exams, that's likely better for an in-office visit. But you'll want to think about the ways that you can use telemedicine as a new opportunity as well. So just because a certain visit wasn't successful in person doesn't mean we should write it off for telemedicine. It could be super successful just because of the barriers that are removed. So for example, take a look at your no-show history, especially in the past. Are there appointment reasons or types with high no-show rates that may be better served by telemedicine? You can also have the opportunity for more connection points, especially in fields like primary care, where you're maybe wanting to check in with some of your chronic care patients more frequently. You can have shorter appointments, but do it more often in a way that doesn't disrupt your schedule as much. One of the tricky things about having a patient come into the office is, of course, that it can be difficult to schedule on both, both sides. What then happens is that a lot gets compressed into one visit. Um, sometimes things go unanswered or something will be brought up at the end of the appointment that could be another long conversation, but you don't really have the time for it. And then scheduling another visit just seems daunting because then the patient comes in and there's this whole check-in, check-out process. And with telemedicine, there's just more opportunity for additional touch, touch points. So think through, especially maybe on a chronic care level, whether you can create a program around that. Now, um, are there patients that might have had more follow-up visits if they had the option of telemedicine because it's so convenient, you don't even know what the possibilities are, maybe offer it and find out if patients are interested, especially at a time where you feel like your schedule is maybe looking a little bit empty. Um, one example here that I hear a lot, especially from aesthetic focused practices, is expanding your reach. If you have people or if you have marketing that's only focused local, you could consider also trying to connect more with patients that are out of state or further away and do initial consultations um, so that they can handle all of their initial conversation with you through telemedicine and then just come up, uh, come you know into your practice, even if they're just two or three hours away, once after having done all of those visits. You could also consider scheduling telemedicine visits with your advanced practice practitioners, so nurse practitioners or PAs, and free up your physician schedule for higher revenue procedures. Um, one of the prospects that I was talking with had a really interesting idea for this a dermatology practice, and they were basically saying, you know, for a lot of our chronic care patients, um, we have these these appointment types where they need to come in and do checkups. And a lot of the times these are visual checks and then we adjust medication. And, and those are great, but we, they were basically talking about using store and forward for it. But I think a different approach could be maybe taking these chronic care consultations to the telemedicine realm, doing the visual checks then, so that you can free up, for example, your, your MDs to do skin checks, right? Because skin checks often result in biopsies, and sort of procedures, and those procedures get reimbursed at a higher rate. So really freeing up your schedule for those higher value, so to speak, procedures can be a great way for you to rework your revenue map a little bit while still offering great care to those chronic care patients. Just an example of, of something that um, I was discussing with, with a prospect. Now, if you have a waiting list of patients, for example, so if you're very, very popular, you should really think about whether you can get those worked off faster with telemedicine. Studies have shown that this is really effective, especially in the specialist services realm. So it could be true even using store and forward or image-based consultations and specialties like dermatology, ophthalmology, ENT. Telemedicine can be really great for same-day appointments. So think a little bit about um, you know, where ordinarily like same day appointments would be impossible to get on your schedule is there maybe, are there maybe five to 10 minute windows that your providers have where they can do a quick visit that you could bill for or get like a cash payment up front for. Think also about this long term because even if a patient does a quick visit with you and it's a super quick one, it might be not great reimbursement for that one visit, but think about the lifetime patient value here. If I have a really great experience with doctor from Joe Schmo medical practice because I just needed something real quick and I had to ask a question and I could do a video visit. Maybe I had to pay 50 bucks, but I could get my question answered. Like I'm going to go back to Dr. Joe Schmo because it was just great and they made time for me when I needed it. This is a little bit more of a marketing tip, but also try to think about who in your patient 
profile would benefit the most from telemedicine and make sure they know about it. And we'll talk a little bit about making that known later. But remote patients who have a long drive or frequent travelers, people who really want like that personal touch, like super VIP type patients who have that concierge expectation could really benefit from telemedicine. The second piece here is collecting feedback from patients. So as you start to change how you deliver care, you're gonna wanna stay close to your patients the same way that we try to stay close to our customers and really listen to how they're responding to the offering. How did I do? What did you like? What did you not like? Um, make sure to maybe avoid asking them during the visit just because that can feel a little bit confrontational for patients. You can always send them a message after or maybe have the front desk ask how everything was. And ideally, if you have a solution in place that does feedback and review collection, integrate it into that process. So we just recommend using messaging because it tends to just be a little bit more honest in terms of the feedback that you get. And I think patients are always flattered when you ask them your opinion. So you'll really, really learn a lot that way. Our third tip is replacing uncompensated phone calls with telemedicine, you know, clinical patient questions, prescription refills, after hours, hours calls. A lot of practices, you know, previously just considered that part of their overall model. This can be an opportunity for, for untapped revenue, especially since your providers and your staff are already going to be spending time on this. Just be sure to align with your biller to see what CPT codes you can use. Resolving routine matters with billable virtual visits. Um, this is just an example for those of you who, who were in our COVID-19 presentation. This is something that you might have seen already, but you know you can see here a patient texts in with a question about a rash, and then the practice responds saying, hey, this is gonna be a online consultation through store and forward if you're okay with that, and you, you're okay with the fee, then just reply yes. And in this case, then the patient confirms the doctor is looped in on their own time. So this is an asynchronous visit, store and forward. And you then disperse the medical advice here. This is sort of goes back to one of the other tips of how much time would this have taken if this was an in-person visit? Yes, the reimbursement rate maybe is higher than a store and forward. But that time that your provider now has on the schedule, can that be used for something that could potentially bring more revenue for the practice? So think about balancing that out. Cash practices. So if you're in an aesthetic focused or sort of elective specialty, um, consider charging fees lower than a traditional copay to incentivize the use of telemedicine. So for example, Amwell, which is a national telemedicine provider where you just can get connected to some rando, um, basically is they charge $69 for one visit. So consider beating that if you have interest in doing a cash pay telemedicine offering and then try it out and see, you know, ask your patients, would you be willing to do that? Some states have laws about zero cost sharing for patients right now. So just make sure that you do check the local regulatory environment. Your administrator should know what's possible there. The other thing that I think I've seen, which is really interesting is the membership-based subscription model. So, you know, direct primary care has been doing this forever. They charge a flat monthly fee for patients and they really have sort of this unlimited model. So for example, um, in a lot of primary care, sort of direct primary care environments, you'll see fees of like 150 a month or $99 a month for unlimited consultations. They also offer 24 seven care, but you can kind of restrict that as much as you want. If you're not comfortable with giving an unlimited plan, you could do something like 50 bucks a month for up to two consultations during the month. This will give you a consistent recurring revenue stream, something that we definitely know from the software environment and a stable patient population. It helps you manage the risk and realize cost savings. It's really great for patients too, because it's just easier for them to budget and plan accordingly. I know that I've been hit with really surprised medical bills that I, don't, that I didn't understand. So consider this as an option for you, especially if you're in a community that's very, very tight knit. And one legal issue to be aware of the subscription model situation is that state insurance laws vary a little bit here. So if you do offer subscription models, it could be that you're considered an insurer by some state. So always run this by your administrator and see how, how the regulatory environment there is. Awesome. I really love that idea personally, actually. So that was really great. So now we are going to move on to our next section. Um, we do have another poll question for you guys. So for those of you who are offering telemedicine, we want to know, 
are you promoting your telemedicine services? So yes, on your website only, yes, everywhere you can, website, social media, et cetera, or not really. These are all anonymous, by the way, so <laughs> no worries. Okay, another mixed bag on this one. Okay, cool. So we're getting mainly uh, not really. So this is great because um, we'll be able to cover this. We have some people, yes, everywhere they can have everything covered. And then some people just on the website, but mainly not really. So Lawrence, why don't you tell us a couple ways that we can um, help these people out? We can be helpful. Yes. <laughs> cool. Informing patients on your website. This is really, really important because like we said, convenience access is really key and most patients look up their doctors online before they go. And it's a really important thing so that just, you know, for all the mentioned reasons we mentioned above, we know if they prefer to talk to you, their doctor, and getting care is a priority for them, um, then, you know, it's key to have that information displayed somewhere prominently on your website. And of course, if you as an established provider offer care that's just as convenient as an on-demand telemed solution like Amwell or Teladoc, patients can have both. So really this hybrid model, embracing this hybrid model of a virtual practice next to your brick and mortar is a great way to create better service for your patients and bind them to your practice. So first things first, make sure that stuff is on your website, front and center, you even have like a little banner. And then also make the call to action really easy for them. I've seen that a lot of people who use Doxy, it's just like, here's our waiting room, but they don't really talk about how to get an appointment. Um, for a lot of people, it's still call. And for our claristas, of course, patients can always go through the website chat or the textable number. Um, we've actually seen for some of our clients that this is helping attract new patients, especially right now. So Google rolled out two new features in search and maps that make it easier for people to connect to virtual care options, including you, the local doctor. They're prioritizing showing virtual care offerings right now. So you'll wanna make sure that these are all over your website and talk to your marketing people that it's included in your SEO. You can see here that Schweiger Dermatology, one of our big derm clients is on Clara and they're the top organic search result if you just look for a telemedicine dermatologist in New York City, which is pretty awesome actually. Like they get promoted that way. Um, now the second tip here is update your Google business profile. So put a virtual care offering in your business profile so that if people are already searching for you, they'll know that it's, this is an option and they can see this get care online link. And that'll be visible on search and maps. Online, offline, again, put flyers in your office, educate patients, talk to your medical assistants, for example, like have your clinical teams say, hey, you know, if you have questions and you want to connect with us, we can always do a virtual visit if you prefer to follow up with care. And just make sure that that messaging is consistent and that your team is aligned on how you're going to market that to patients. Um, use mass messaging to notify existing patients. I know that this was a huge, huge, huge use case for a lot of clients that we brought on new. They basically can, you know, because they had all these canceled appointments, they used Clara's broadcast functionality to um, blast a text to a bunch of patients saying like, hey, we're still here for you. We're available for telemedicine if you want to, you know, if you don't feel comfortable coming into the office or because of the shutdown. So you'll want to get the word out by using those types of functionalities. And there's a bunch of different mass texting tools that could do this. Um, and for our current Clara customers, we do have an email template and some images that you can use in the help center. So you can just go to support.clara.com and find those there. You can also spread the word on social media, just showing here what Spring Street Dermatology, one of our clients is doing on Instagram. They actually made a GIF of what the video visit experience is like, and then put that on their Instagram and added the instructions of patients for patients how to get into even getting a video visit. So they did kind of the start to finish. This is what it's, the experience is gonna be like, and this is how you get access to a video visit. I just thought that was really clever. And they can, and the second point here is continue to promote it. So make sure that 
patients know that you're keeping the offering so that um, you know, you continue to provide updates even as maybe you have multiple locations, if you're opening new ones, you can remind patients also if you're opening new locations then in new markets that this is something that's part of your core strategy. Offer telemedicine as an option in your no-show engagement. Ashley and I thought that this was a really clever way of basically getting low-hanging fruit, like patient no-shows to the appointment, they're more or less gone. If you have a solution that engages patients on their no-shows, you can always offer them, like, if you prefer to have this visit via telemedicine as opposed to in-person, great, just book it here. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. So I actually, we did have another poll, but I think maybe we should just jump into this section because we're getting close on time and I wanna make sure we have time to cover all of our workflow uh, stuff. So why don't you jump into that? Cool. Visits happening virtually. We need to think about everything that happens physically in your office virtually too. I'm sure all of you who are practice managers have had the joy of experiencing the challenge between around telemedicine that's really communication and change management. The best way to combat this is for staff to learn to coordinate telemedicine visits in a matter that is the same as in-person visits. And if you have tools in the office that let you do things digitally from like a check-in perspective, and I'll get to that a little bit later, try and integrate that and align it for physical and virtual visits the exact same way, because then the sort of switching costs that your team needs to do mentally is way lower. For most patients, they're likely gonna want a hybrid approach where they're evaluated via telemedicine for the initial consult and they come into the office for the procedure. So these workflows are gonna to need to flow between them. And I think patients really appreciate the consistency that the experience is the same. You know, a lot of practices have created these like haphazard digital workflows to accomplish tele telemedicine visits only, but it's really missing the point because if a digital workflow can work for you for the physical office as well, then why not just have everything run online? If you're already collecting insurance and consent for your virtual visits, then just consider doing it for everything if you can do a paperless as opposed to you know, doing the, the form thing. And my, my next point here really is that um, this is something that we're actually working with practices on. So Simon Bowles next week is gonna be hosting a webinar on this exact topic. So setting up a contactless patient experience that helps your practice grow. This, so this is really pairing those two together to create the onboarding. So spoiler alert, register for that stuff because it's awesome. The second tip that we have for you is make sure that your telemedicine experience is as easy as possible for patients. Even if you're not using Clara, try and look at how easy it is for patients to access it because I've heard feedback from providers who say, oh, patients hate telemedicine. They prefer to come in for an in-office visit. But that could also be that your telemedicine process is just so difficult for patients to get through that getting in a car, driving 30 minutes, and then coming to your office seems easier to them. I did talk to a practice that said their dermatology practice on Emma, and they mentioned that start to finish from like the patient getting an appointment, getting the patient into the visit, including forms and everything, the billing manager was very, very proud of herself that she managed to reduce the process down to 52 minutes for one patient, which is insane. Like, what is the patient doing? Like, what, what other things could the patient be doing during that time? So really try and, like, try it for yourself and also try to reduce your tech savviness a little bit, maybe, and try and go through that process and time it and see what happens. Um, I think if the experience is worse than an in-person visit, and I touched it, touched on it earlier, then you can't really expect them to uh, pay the same amount. Um, you know, I think it doesn't really take that much more effort to be exceptional. It really just takes a commitment to be willing to work on it and be a little bit better than the rest. With the right tool and systems in place, you can really make a difference. Um, so I think that also this topic really goes back to thinking about your patients from a consumer standpoint. And if you can have a consumer patient experience that stands out among the rest, that'll make a big, big difference. Also from a revenue standpoint. I'm creating this space for follow-up and I talked a little bit about it, um, giving this example that medical assistants recommend telemed visits for any follow-up questions. 
creating a safe space where patients can ask questions and um, have that open conversation with you is just to continue to create that really, really valuable relationship. The second tip here, I hope a lot of you are already doing this, you know, for people who do use appointment reminder solutions, if you have automatic appointment reminders going out, create a specific appointment type for telemedicine visits and make sure that the instructions for onboarding are included in those appointment reminders. Put your tech vendor to work, you know, link videos, for example, for onboarding, or even if you don't have an appointment reminder solution in place, when you schedule the appointment, text or email a video on how to get into the video visit instantaneously to your patient. Ask, hey, did you receive it? Open it. When I hang up, please look at it. At least this way, you can educate your patients and you don't need to spend 20 minutes at the beginning of the visit to try and get them into the visit. Um, one other thing that I think is one that I've seen make visits a lot more successful for some things that are visual, ask patients to send you pictures ahead of the visit, just to, you know, so the doctor can familiarize himself and make sure that they're aware of all the issues and then can just have a focused conversation with patients one-on-one -on -one, um, where it's not so much maybe the exam, but it's more the conversation about what the treatment plan is going to be. Now, Different channels of communication work together. So really thinking about how do texting and video, or if you email patients, like how do those things flow together and need to work together for an optimal experience? They don't have to work against each other. And what you can see here on the slide is really a flow of what the experience might look like um, from the moment that a patient um, had follow-up after, after a visit where they came into the office and then responded, received some, you know, sent in the picture, the provider corresponded. So I think there are some really creative ways that you can integrate all these sort of tech tools and put them together as one seamless experience for patients. And of course, for us, the, the combination of texting and video visits is really a great way to create that engagement. Last but not least, don't forget about internal communication. Lots of my clients are partially remote, office manager is not in the office, front desk is not in the office. They're staggering their work schedules to allow for social distancing. So really try and think about whether it's your EMR, if it's Clara, if it's something else, integrating your internal communication into these flows so that when your workflows are virtual, they work just as well as um, when you're talking to people in the office. So make sure that you can triage, make sure that things don't need to get printed out and passed across the desk. That's sort of a really great example of where I also sometimes see that Clara is a little bit underutilized because the practice has been so used to talking in person about everything. Like, you know, weave in that internal communication and create the document that just continues documentation as well um, to make things easier for your staff so that everything is in one place.